Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Unity 15.5 feature review. I'm joined here with Fiona, Fiona Wong, who's uh, helping me out. Um, going to be fielding all your questions. And um, as well, if you need to get us, we'll talk a little bit about how to use uh, GoToWebinar. I'm also here with uh, Christopher Hebert, um, Marketing Director for SignFX Software. And as I said before, we're going to take a look at all the features inside of the new 15.5. Uh, so I'm just going to go full screen. Let's pray this works. And over there. So I've got a whole bunch of slides that I'm going to be running through, through as, as well as, well as firing up the as we go along. And as we run through this webinar, um, by all means, uh, chat us, us um, ask questions. So there's two. Uh, two options you'll notice in the GoToWebinar um, uh, widget on the side, and you can actually uh, ask us questions, and Fiona and Chris is going to help organize that, as well as uh, definitely message us and chat us. Uh, we want to hear a whole bunch of different ideas. Meeting 15.5 was released last Thursday, along with our new website, and we finally got things going, and it's all working very well now. So you guys, a lot of you already had the software for a few days, so uh, definitely ask us more specific questions if you want to see those. And more importantly, uh, we want to keep on doing these webinars. This is our first one as a group uh, in recent times, that is. And also, uh, give us ideas for future webinars, things that you would like us to see live, things that would make a lot of sense us using, us using the online live action. So that's, that's one of the things I enjoy doing with this group. Hey, Jeff, we're getting some bad echoes, so uh, maybe we can work on that audio a bit. Okay, so we're just going to see if we can work on the audio a bit. I think the echoes are coming from my own microphone, so... Yeah, so that should be better. Is that better? Better on the echo, or is it still pretty bad? Oh, yes. yes. Okay, it's better. Excellent. So as we're working with, with webinars, as I said before, ask as many questions as you want. Um, oh, see, so you've got lots of stuff happening already. Thank you. And uh, the, I've got the webcam going up polls. We probably won't have a chance to get to the polls because of a tremendous amount of features. Now, you notice also on the GoToWebinar, there's a handout um, that I'm offering to you guys. It's a much more complete feature list for Uni 15.5, more complete than what we offer on the on, on the actual documentation. So give that, uh, you can actually download that and, and give it a read as we're doing the presentation as well. So let's try again with the echoes fixed and present forward. Okay. So 15.5. Um, we released Foodie 15 early this year, and it saw a, a great introduction of uh, new modeling tools, new rendering and animation tools, along with a whole bunch of enhancements to the various solvers that we have. And as we realize, it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of uh, pipelines within within the, both the visual effects and the games uh, arena. And uh, so it was also, I saw some really nice improvements with handling big data. Now we're at 15.5. This is a mid-release off, uh, update offering. Uh, it's uh, thanks to Kristen Margale and the R&D team, uh, we decided to split Houdini 15 into 15.5 a couple months ago. And then uh, Kristen pulled everybody in R&D and said, what can what we back back for you guys? guys? And one of the things that uh, were key to backporting that we could safely do from the current development stream um, is um, we have the whole indie third party rendering. We heard you loud and clear for the last two years. You really uh, like indie, but you also have a great slew of renderers out there that you want to go and play with it. And being the entrepreneurs that you guys are, we certainly have that now inside of indie. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Improved crowd tools and. <laughs> Almost half my slides are on crowds. Um, so a big update in 15.5. Improved modeling improvements? Uh, absolutely. We need to polish this modeling. We're club moving forward. We're being pulled all the time by games. And future films just getting the benefit from that. And commercial artists, those generalists out there, um, yeah, it, we're, we're certainly improving our modeling tools and, and making it an even more rounded uh, generalist type of application. And a ton of other stuff. So we're going to end the modeling. So this is the agenda, modeling, then hair fur and grooming, crowds, texture improvements, VR, OpenGL, animation. So those are the things that we're going to be taking a look at. So if you need to take a break or, or step out for a bit, that's good. Okay. So first features on the edit saw. Uh, we 
lots of improvements to edit subs. Um, we can now, um, and this is a long time coming, double click. We can double click on faces to do entire group selections. We can double click on points to get point rings. And we can also double click on edges to get edge loops. So it's very easy now to create these things uh, to basically select the loops and, and using both the A hotkey and the shift key and the control key, we can now make uh, additive, additive and negative selections. And evenly spaced selection and straightened selection. So there's a bit of a screenshot here where you can see there's uh, I just used the rightmost button in, in, in blank screen space using the edit top, and I did something very, very simple that would have been very challenging in Houdini 15.0, which is uh, uh, just select some faces, straighten them, circle them, and then flatten them. Um, really easy to do now inside of 15.5. And here's another little quick snapshot of how you can use it to do multiple, um, multiple edit circles at a time, uh, with it being a procedural tool, right? So the next step is, and this one um, is seen a big update, poly split sub. And for those of you who don't, are fairly new to Houdini, yes, we do use these acronyms. And yes, I do use these acronyms. We have SOP. And um, don't blame me for that acronym. I actually love it. It's a, it's, a, it's a great way to speak to somebody very quickly. Instead of using the generic node, when somebody says, oh, I put down a SOP, I know exactly that they're in the geometry context and I know they're doing something, modifying something. SOP is short form for a surface operator. And uh, my first taste of prisons was in 93, and uh, these acronyms were already deeply entrenched, so um, I used them all the time. So SOP means geometry. So the poly split SOP um, is completely new, much more interactive. Um, and all I did um, in this sphere is I just selected uh, for the square for the, for the square cut, I just selected four points. And then there's an option in the poly split called quad auto completion, which automatically, if, this, if the cut primitive was originally a quad, it ends up being a quad as well. So um, really, really quick. So four clicks, you've got yourself a cut box. You can then extrude off of that, smooth it out, flatten it, uh, and build off of that. Because it's very important to have these islands when we're building and modeling to have these normalized topologies. And there's another sweet thing inside of PolySplit too. Um, we've been waiting for this feature a very long time. Um, how do you cut a surface with a curve? So PolySplit now has a second right input. And you can see in the little network here, I've got a curve going through a transform. I drew the curve on the surface, snapping onto it. It seems PolySplit really likes that curve to be raised off the surface a bit. Remember, it's like the ray sop. And if you know how the ray sop works, um, it uses a direction vector. So you've got to pull it up a bit off the surface, and that's what the transform is there to do. I mean, I could have peaked the curve as well, or peaked the original sphere that I was templating on. Either way, PolySplit uses curves. And you can turn on or off quad auto-completion when you're cutting with curves as well. In this case, I turn it on. If you turn it off, um, what you'll just do is you get a start and the end of the curve gets cut in, but everywhere else you won't get any of those connections. So if you need to do a poly explain on that or, or bevel that out, um, you can do that very easily now. So some other things, explicitization allows for upstream changes. What that means is it's just an option which um, safeguards your poly splits to any upstream topology changes. So if you change the size of the geometry, it knows what uh, derivative from the primitive it hit, and it'll try and keep up with that. So one of those things that we need, because um, not only do we have to build these modeling tools to do really cool modeling, it's Houdini, right? And we always have to make sure that these things can be used in a procedural fashion. So we've got a much higher level that we need to attain when we're doing these modeling tools. Uh, obviously, generate edge groups, holding shift key snaps the closest vertex. It's just a really good update tool. Poly bevel. Uh, I'm a big fan of the old poly bevel. It did a great job, but it, it actually could fail in a lot of specific cases, and it created some nasty corner intersections sometimes. So a completely new rewrite inside of Houdini 15.5. And this one is a huge update. So here I just did a quick uh, window frame. And uh, you can use more than one poly bevel. I mean, I just took the base frame in, which you can see ghosted in the back. So I just did an original chamfer on the first uh, inside edge, chamfered it out. Then I selected the outer amp chamfer edge and did another inside rabbit. And the inside rabbit used um, a ramp that just basically did a simple step. And then the third one uses a, uses a, a poly bevel using a curve profile. And I used the curve profile to do the outside molding. And you can see that in, in the snapshot again, it says shape profile. 
And uh, so you can use the ramp parameter, custom curve. It does simple bevels, simply very robust. Have a look at the help. It does an awful lot of uh, really nice, clean geometry and uh, offset fixed distance. So we can use that one interactively, maybe. What's that, Fiona? I have a question about uh, UVs um, maintain, being maintained, uh, being preserved. So UVs being maintained in poly bevel. Poly -bevel. Um, Yes. Um, for now, we are aware of the, the, um, the UV issues, and it does do a fairly good job with the UVs, um, but uh, we can always rely for now on attribute transfer, but uh, please submit those uh, requests for enhancement into support, and we'll see if we can address those. Remember, these are completely new rewrites, and I noticed that uh, I was just watching some, some really cool videos done by Rohan. Um, he released a really cool set of procedural modeling, and I noticed that one of our new tools actually couldn't do one step. So, and as I said before, we need to revisit these tools and make sure they work under all of these uh, procedural ways. So, another example of polybevel that Fiona did of a, of a scope on a gun. And as we all know, scopes need to diffract the light. So, Fiona was very easily just to select the interface and just use a ramp to create the steps. Not an issue at all anymore. So, much more than just a polybevel. Um, if you want to do the procedural thing. So dissolve solve. Um, dissolve was a bit finicky in the previous releases. Um, you select some edges, it would fail, sometimes it wouldn't fail. Topology changes would sometimes cause it issues. So another rewrite for the dissolve, so dissolve 2.0. Um, it's much faster at dissolving edges, it's more intuitive, more reliable. Um, and I just showed you a case that probably would have failed in 15.0, works just fine inside of 15.5. Um, a retopology tool phase two. So Fiona had a really nice introductory video. If you haven't seen that, definitely go see it. Um, the retopology tool. Um, in this case, I just took a sphere and I reworked the pole um, to give it proper quads. Um, so uh, it has the same options that the edit shop has, where we can make a circle from selection, evenly spaced selections. Uh, we can straighten edge paths as well, all meanwhile doing retopology. So basically use that middle mouse button to complete your current retopology stretch to enter into this edit mode in retopology. So I'm always hitting the middle mouse button in retopology, drawing a few quads, middle mouse, draw some more quads, middle mouse, and uh, you can click and drag out edges. It's a great tool. Um, and uh, easy rework, simple stuff like a sphere pole and uh, so PolyExpand 2D, um, introduced into previous releases of Houdini, uh, we now added inside scale and outside scale, and attributes that is. So we have, I just have a simple example of creating two wranglers, where I just initialize each of the two variables, and I just added a simple channel so I could tweak the values with some random values. And as you can see, it's very easy to create random offsets now with PolyExpand 2D. So if you need to do roads that vary width across the length, um, you can try and use PolyExpand 2D as one, one approach to creating really nice inset offset curves. And uh, again, in other applications, this could be a different tool, but PolyExpand 2D is really good at taking a flat 2D surface, take a curve, expand it, you can vary it, vary it by attributes. And I want to step back a bit here. And that is um, all of these new solves. Um, they're using input attributes. That is by design. Uh, local variables in the older type SOPs, you know, we had the copy SOP, and uh, the biggest one is the point SOP, where you use local attributes to control uh, the various features of the software based on the input geometry. Uh, we're now moving into a new world where we're using attributes into all of these new operators. And by initializing these attributes upstream, these operators seamlessly work on these attributes. Um, it future saves us in the architecture of Houdini in that we can now start to explore um, multi-threading these operators much more efficiently, and, and it just basically is a much more cleaner way of working where attributes by name don't have these special variables that have these different names. They're basically an attribute name is an attribute name. So PolyExpand 2D, great tool for, for creating variable width. Delta Mush. Um, with our character push, uh, we've adding some nice deformers, and one of the deformers that we could backport into 15.5 is the delta mush. Um, the delta mush is actually put inside of the, the biped female and the biped male rigs on the shelf. And this is just a quick snapshot. I just uh, ripped the asset open, dove inside of the skin object, 
and just merged uh, with a bit of a transform so you can see the difference between the two. So Delta Mush, it's one of these really cool voodoo deformers um, from the old Rhythm and Hughes character tools um, that just basically makes any pad geometry look decent. And stepping back, it means that this tool is also a procedural tool. It can be used to do all kinds of different, um, so if you have some really awkward deformations, very harsh, where we sometimes have to use smooth deformers or smoothing attributes to get a really nice uh, deforming geometry, eh, throw that away. Try doing a really raw, hard deformation and then just throw a delta mush and see where it gets you. Because in essence, what it is, is it's a smoothing tool that also tries to retain some of the sharp features. So think of it as a sharpened filter with some blur in it on geometry, though. And uh, it works very well that way. So geometry viewport snapping. Um, we now have, um, this is one of the little things, but it, but it means a lot when you're actually placing objects in the scene. So we can now even uh, snap to x-ray geometry in the viewport. And a we have occlusion checking at it for snapping and for also orientation picking. But remember to turn orient on snap on using the right mouse button on any of the four snap options. So you can turn on orient on snap and then you get that feature for, for free. And you'll notice I, I accidentally turned off x-ray geometry in my snapping when I took the snapshot, but <clears throat> definitely turn on x-ray geometry. So 3D viewport handles. Um, <clears throat> so just, just an update on the handles. Um, some nice options to turn on. Some people wanted to see the negative handle as well as the positive handle. Other people's don't. Is the default previously, so you have a lot of control over that. And the view in the view, view space rotate ring on the rotate handle just makes a lot of sense when you're doing any sort of animation manipulation. So that's it for the modeling <clears throat> for the modeling tools. Um, so how are we doing on the feedback? We're good. Uh, yeah, let's keep rolling. So I don't know if we want to fire Pudini yet, or yeah. want to fire Pudini? Yeah. Okay, so let's see a little bit of that in anger. I have some files here. I got a scene file up. So um, I'm on the Mac. Oh, by the way, the platform I'm using, in case anybody is uh, was wondering, it's a Mac laptop. It's a, a latest generation MacBook Pro. Um, it does have NVIDIA graphics. I snagged this one, so it doesn't have EMD graphics, but um, but it's worked quite, quite well, and I've got, uh, I think it's uh, 12 gigs of memory, and it's a single core i7. So what I'm going to do now is um, take a look at a couple, of, a couple of the operators that I've been looking at. So let's take a look here. So as I said before, in, in the one example snapshot, I can do the sphere, so... Um, Hopefully the is the playback okay or uh, you're actually not sharing the, the screen. Let me see. Oh, I am. Um, so people are saying. There's, there's oh, a, there's a lag. oh, bit of a lag. Yeah. yeah so um, game where we're we're basically feeling feeling out to go to webinar. Um, yes, it's our first time. <laughs> our first time using go to webinar. So uh, definitely wanna want to iron out the bugs and then if we're, we're going to be playing a few movies later on uh, I was pretty careful with the movies because I know sometimes uh, you know depending on what it is we might have the frame rate too low but uh, hit enter go to the select mode and um, so now you can go three double click on an edge and you actually grab the entire edge ring and we can do all kinds of tools with that but basically what I want to do is just do a tab edit I sometimes just like to select the transform geometry and let's select so let's select um, four. So, so we have, actually, we go have ahead. a question. Um, any way to use a VR headset inside Houdini? And I believe the answer is no. No, no uh, VR headset inside of Houdini. Uh, Although, um, having said that, um, not directly supported, but uh, there is uh, some really strong Python modules that do support that. And we do have a Python SOC. So I don't think that that would be, uh, if you're a little bit handy, would be too much of an issue to implement that inside of Houdini to support it. And he also had a question about the best way to learn Houdini as a beginner. The Super best way to learn Houdini as a beginner. Um, I'm thinking that that could be another webinar. <laughs> so um, for now, the best way to learn Houdini is, um, oh, that's, a, that's a deep question. I have my own. Uh, ways of teaching Houdini that I would love to share with everybody. It's quite different than a lot of the other things that are online. And uh, I've been doing this for over 22 years, so um, I definitely would love to, 
to see that. So definitely we'll carry that one forward. Thank you, that one's a great question. So anyway, I got my, my curves here, and if I wanted to take, uh, let's, uh, let's grab these lines, and then I can right mouse, and then I can just basically straighten the selection so it makes it nice and regular, and you can see it's nice and flat. So really easy to work this stuff up. And again, I can go for, select these uh, four polygons, and then I can do a poly extrude, and you can pull it out, and you get a really nice flat selection. Um, but sometimes what I will do is not doing that because sometimes a poly extrude. Um, let me redo that, and I'll show you a little bit. Um, so let's redo this, this handle. The problems you get is um, if I try and poly bevel this, I'm going to get some really awkward situations when you get these uh, these these sort of conditions. So what I tend to do is I'm going to blow with this poly extrude and do another one. But uh, again, just going to select this ring. So sometimes what I do is I select the ring, and then I'll just do a poly extrude on just the ring. If I can type, and uh, then you can you can actually do an inset offset first. And uh, let me go here. Actually, let me there's this, let me just show you here, so I can do a reselect here and pick up the last edge that I missed. And then you can you can do an inset offset, and uh, and then you can poly extrude from there. So let's select the four faces again, and then tab poly extrude, pull it out. That would be my wheel mouse going. <laughs> and then um, you can then select uh, select this ring, do three, and then let me just select these guys. And then we can do a poly, poly bevel on these guys. Sometimes the ring selection, it doesn't know how to find some of these, these, these T intersections. And then just do a poly bevel. And the poly bevel, we can do some distances. So there's all kinds of options with poly bevel that we can use. Um, as I said, there's chamfer, solid. Um, and we can go to crease, chamfer, and then round. But where the fun starts is under profile. Um, you can create some really interesting profiles here. So I can grab the one profile, go up, and cut this down, and then cut that down. And so you can create um, that kind of a chamfer, which is one of the things I did for the window frame. Or I can draw a curve. So turn my construction plane on. I'm just going to draw a curve way over here. And when I do that, I always do creating context. Because if you're creating context, it doesn't jump up and create an object. So I'm just going to draw a curve anywhere. And I can just draw this curve. Let's create, I'm going to create a profile that looks something like this. Hit enter. And then I can wire this curve right into the poly bubble. And then in the poly bubble, I can choose to use that curve. So instead of uh, profile as ramp, profile curve from second input. I need to add a lot more divisions in order to actually resolve that feature. But um, once you do that, you can now see that the curve is actually driving the poly bevel. Now, for those of you who've been using Houdini a long time, you'll know that we have tools like the sweep saw. And the sweep saw really wants your profile to be at the origin in the correct orientation. And if you mess something up, it's fussy. And so poly bevel will actually take the curve uh, as it is in the scene and then just use that as a poly bevel. So it's smart enough to know the first and last vertex and, and pin that to your, to your poly bevel width and then just go forward. So really easy, straightforward. And this is, uh, this is a lot more of our tools are now becoming a lot easier to use this way. So poly bevel is pretty cool. I think we'll call it a shot for now. We, we can actually, if you guys want later on, if you want to see some more modeling things specifically, you can obviously fire up Houdini and we'll leave that for some Q&A at the very end. So I'll leave the scene up and running. Actually, I'll save it, and I'll just save it to the desktop. And as I say, the desktop is the new temp directory. So, and let's get to the questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a couple of questions that are specific to this. Sure. Uh, so, so far in the order that I received them in. Um, Mike mentioned about this symmetrizing. Oh, oh symmetry. Um, isn't it better to switch off the symmetrize? 
So yeah. There is an option to. Yeah, there's an option to turn on and off symmetry. I'm just hacking away here. Yeah. And then Aaron asked, uh, does the size of the curve affect the bevel, or is it relative to the bevel itself? It's relative to the bevel itself. So the curve coming in, it's based on the fixed distance. So if I increase the distance, it's actually controlling the curve. And I do have a profile scale down in here. So as the distance increases, the profile curve will scale as well. So I should dial back the scale. So you can see here dialing back the scale sort of tames the, tames the, the curve extrusion down a bit. Yep. And we can reverse the profile, which basically just does a reverse on the input curve. So just flipping the vertex order. Um, we have some options in here called uh, allow vertex splits. Uh, sometimes turning that off gives you much simpler miters in the corners, but it will stretch based on the topology because fixed distance in some cases can't be withheld because if you have non-planar quads, you know, if one of the vertex on the quads makes a non-planar quad, it's a, it's a really, really difficult issue to try and keep a fixed distance. That's why a lot of these hard surface modelers enforce planar quads. Who needs does not enforce planar quads? So um, some of these tools, it gets a bit tricky when we try and do these poly extrudes with a lot of vertex splits off. So how are we doing? Uh, we have some other non-modeling sure. non related questions. OK. Um, so are there any specific requirements for mocap files, um, in particular mocap files from perception neuron mocap capture system? So as far as I know, when we're bringing mocap in, and we'll get back to the presentation of the crowd, um, to, to basically for mocap, um, if you can export motion analysis or uh, biovision type files, or in this case, FBX, because our crowd tools can also bring in FBX rigs. And then from there, you can extract um, for, for motion capture sessions that way. But I know we have a, a few command line tools that are available for taking motion analysis files and, and the claim data type file formats. I think there's another one in there as well. So if you can, uh, oh, BioVision. So um, any of those three formats will work inside of Houdini. So you can bring your motion that way in. Yep, one more question, um, I guess. One more. Yeah, any plans to create an ice like tool set with some prefabricated compounds? For example, get closest position on geometry and bobs? Oh, fantastic question. Um, we actually, um, what can I say? Um, yes, uh, we are looking at giving even more powerful tools to do that. Um, we actually um, added in, I think this is one of the, I'm not sure if we put this in 15.5 or not, but we now have a way of actually picking up the derivative information with uh, get closest point, which we weren't doing up until now. And we discovered this when we were starting to do some more advanced work in, in characters using curves to control curves to control some animation tools. So um, I don't know if that's in 15.5 or the next release, I'm not sure. But uh, we also have uh, another SOP in here that you definitely want to take a look at, which is um, a polyframe. Or then there's a couple other ones as well. But uh, uh, there's a couple different ways to find closest point, but uh, not closest derivative yet. So in BOPS. And uh, to the answer to giving you a more complete ice-like uh, interface for VOPS, um, we do have a bit of a nod for when you're doing some, let's add a VOP, let's add attribute VOP. And we can dive inside of this. And I can show you a bit of this uh, sort of a scenario that we do. So basically, a nice tree in soft image is, uh, is a single object. Compounds are written in C++. Um, there really is no specific uh, analogy to that. VOPs are actually coded in just, uh, just standard VEX code, which is very similar to C flat C or C sharp. Very, very simple language to get in. You don't have to worry about declaring anything. And what I like to do here is I will open up the, the we have a little bit of a, we have a list of all the various operators that we can work on. And then for instance, if we wanted to use some noise, we could just take some anti-alias noise, drag and drop that in there. And uh, maybe not cell noise, but let's just do a standard, uh, uh, just a standard, uh, anti-alias noise, which is the, just drag and drop that wire position into P and wire noise into P. And each one of these operators has, uh, you know, 3D noise, 3D noise. And then we can add some noise onto that. And just made a garbage out of it. So in the amplitude, I can cut that back down. But uh, so, and the roughness tame that back a bit. So there's many different ways of, of working with ops. But again, that's another thing we could work on, like another 
interesting topic that we could cover in the future is how to use uh, ops to do um, you know for, for for creating these these different types of trees. So do you want to save save the questions and then continue? yeah we'll save the questions. Okay. So now on to uh, grooming and we'll do we'll fire Pudini again and do some grooming. Uh, there's uh, so with regards to grooming we have uh, hair and fur and really nice updates. We realized that Houdini 15.0, we took a little bit of a back step as we brought the actual curve grooming up to speed. We have some really nice tools in there for making curve grooming a lot more efficient. But the whole fur procedural approach to, to putting attributes on the surfaces didn't quite marry as tightly as we wanted to the drawing of curves. So 15.5 brings back a much tighter coupling between the two. As a matter of fact, it's now seamless going from generating some fur and then working that fur into hair and then combing that hair out. And the curve groom sop is a critical tool in, in a lot of these updates. So uh, skin paint tools now only use the current fur object, which means uh, it's a lot easier and more streamlined. It's a lot harder to lose focus and, and to get kicked out into another object. So we have new length scaling parameter uh, for post groom adjustments, which really is all about um, doing those fine tweaks at the end, where instead of uh, you're just forced to use curves, you can now actually use attributes back on the surface again. And uh, really nice uh, safety uh, safety uh, tools in that you can't. Uh, select any object and start painting on it. So we sort of give you a warning now if you're trying to draw uh, or, or modify hair primitives on a primitive that doesn't have the, the right sound. So hair shader is now an HDA about time because now we can actually version support it, which means if you're customizing the hair shader, you can version support it as well. So, uh, and that means if there's any issues and we need to bump up for the next version, we can do that very easily. Um, it also means that we can take advantage of pre-compilation of, of ops where it, where it uh, makes sense to have uh, much more efficient updates. So approved filtering of selections with the groom parameter. Um, yeah, definitely want to show this. And of course, UDIM support for hair shader textures. So let's, I'm going to want to fire that one up and uh, I have a bit of a file prepared for that. So um, let's double click on this thing, discard and load. And so this example is I just took uh, one of the girl, the, the, the female model, and I just started, uh, I just started off on the, started with the hair, I just started with the add fur, and then I went immediately to the grooming tools. So I started drawing hairs using the screen brush, using the surface brush. But as you're using these tools, you'll realize that um, they're all using the curve groom. And as you start using the curve groom more and more, you can change uh, different types of brushes that you have available to you. And the one thing that we can do now is much more easily recache the strokes. So when we do that, um, we're actually now saving all the strokes as a cache. It lightens up the curve groom to start from scratch. So basically what's happening is if we don't recache the strokes, every time we're grooming a uh, stroke, all the strokes are being updated all the time. So by doing the recache of the strokes, um, you, can, you can then cache them and then move forward. Another thing that we've added that's much improved in 15.5 is the primitive group. So if I select this, I can actually select a region of the hair that I want to work on. And if I hit enter, now I can start just grooming just that region to get back a lot of interactivity. So when you're using these groom tools, I'm always using the shelf tool to change the states, but also be aware that you can select the curve groom itself. And all the shelf tools are doing is just resetting the various parameters. So basically, these are just presets on top of the curve group. So by selecting the region you want to work on, select the region over here. I want to work on the front here. And uh, maybe you want to do a bit of a lift of the hair on that region. Actually, I should have hit Enter. So let me select that region, hit Enter. And now maybe I want to do a little bit of lifting of the hair there so I can lift the hair off the scalp. So lift, lift it off a bit so you can actually lift the hair. So it's a really nice interactive tool. So let's go back to the slides. Any questions on that? Or? Uh, some... uh, can character rigs created with Houdini rigs be? Sorry, I <laughs> let's, let's read it. So I'm okay. getting a question off so the screen. 
can the character rigs created with the Houdini rigs be animated and then exported as FBX into Unity and Unreal Engine 4? Is the skeleton and animation playable in Unity and QE4? I know there's some work that we did a year ago to get the FB, FBX rigs into Unity. So um, I haven't tried it myself recently, but uh, I was able to get it to go. So um, definitely, um, please try that. Uh, should, go ahead. Sorry, I also messaged uh, Damien, who is developing the um, uh, Unity yeah. um, engine for Unity. Yeah, so we'll get and the question. And he said that the question, the answer is yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, so you can do that. Um, because I did try it, not in 15.5 though, so it did work in 15. So uh, please try it in 15.5. Question on, on grooming, which is that can you easily clump clumps? Previously we had to modify for deep, uh, for yes. cool people. Yes, so that's that part of the post groom thing. So uh, clumping hair is one of the things that got a great improvement. So um, you can now create clumps on, oh, pardon me if I go over where my selection is. So you can create some clumps on the area that we need to work on, and you can fine tweak those clumps later on. Although, uh, we still want to add a lot more improvements in that area to get some nice sub clumping. So, what I'm, what I'm thinking of is you've ever seen a cat, when it pulls it back out, you're sort of getting these chunks of clumps on those lines. And we, we can, you can more than do that, it's just that we want to make sure that those tools are available um, off the shelf. And another question. Mm -hmm. uh, any plans to include Git as an option inside Houdini for HDA version control? Ah, I can't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> Answered. <laughs> so, um, we have uh, one comment that yeah. says uh, he is exporting animated characters in DD4. Yeah, yeah, yes. Because we, we had some issues. Uh, no, so be all right. So I bet you you probably found a forum post that was about a year and a half ago when we did have issues. So I know that a lot of that has, has addressed. And I was able to take, uh, and I was able to round trip an FBX character from, um, from Motion Builder into Houdini, and then from Houdini into both Unity and Unreal. And, uh, so it worked OK. There's a question about uh, ignoring hair guides. Can hair follicle placement happen procedurally via texture coordinates, for example, painted stubble? Absolutely. So um, when we're doing a lot of these uh, curve grooming tools, they're actually using um, a combination of surface tools and guide tools. But if I middle mouse on a lot of uh, these, uh, middle mouse on one of these tools, you can see that there's glue to animation and glue origin. So all of these attributes in the spreadsheet, and this is why you'll notice that I'm not using the build desktop, right? Um, I really enjoy using the technical desktop. And I encourage a lot of users that are starting to get more meaningful into the Houdini sessions to actually go to the technical desktop because you get the tree view. And you also get the spreadsheet. And if you want to follow any videos and uh, where the network is at the top and the bottom, just push the switcher bar. And now you can follow any tutorial. But you now can inspect what tools are being added, what apps are being created. And you can also see over here on the left-hand side, some of these tools spray nodes in a few different directories. So seeing what happens makes a big deal for me. So that's why I always like using the technical desktop. It gives me a great uh, foothold to interrogate any scene and figure out what's going on really quickly and then move forward. So as you can see here, um, there is all kinds of attribute support for the, for the surfaces in here. Absolutely, you can write your own procedural uh, grooming and hair toolkit. And it's, the nice thing about the tools is it's not per vertex, it's per face. So the tools actually interpolate varying uh, face attributes as opposed to being stuck on the vertices as well. So that opens up the door to changing topologies, to uh, swapping and mixing and applying one groom onto another character. And we do have a tool that allows you to do that under the, the grooming. Um, I know there's a way of transforming grooms from one character to another from the shelf. But uh, I usually do it inside of uh, SOPS, just put down that we transfer and go from there. OK, so good. Keep on going. Yes. OK, crowds. Um, big update in 15.5 for crowds. So we have uh, a complete crowd shelf to overhaul, although it doesn't look like it's changed much. Uh, underneath the scenes, a lot has. Um, we're finding crowds is getting a lot of traction now in a lot of facilities. Um, it's because it's, it's a type of a crowd tool that doesn't completely 
take over your crowd pipeline. It augments your crowd pipeline, very much like Houdini augments other technologies inside of a game and film pipeline. Uh, so, and also, uh, so what it allows you to do then is just basically create your agents from any point cloud and then move forward. Or you could use Houdini to the entire crowd from beginning to end. And because it's all open-ended and the majority of the logic is written in VEX, again, I like using these acronyms, VEX for Vector Expression Language, which is just that simple C-like language that, uh, well, Fiona says simple. <laughs> it, for me, it's... Funny. With bunny ears. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm, I'm still, still, yeah. It's it's actually if if you're if you're a technical artist that's used to writing scripts and and a bit of code, uh, Vex offers no no real issues that way to get up and running. It's actually it's very loosely typed, so it's very 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 compliant to writing loose code. So you don't have to really manage your your, your variable types to the nth degree. It's a very, very fun language to learn. If you ever want to learn how to write shaders, Vex is a great language to explore that. But getting back to crowds, go ahead. Oh, sorry, question about HScript. It, it's going to be a is HScript going to be a dying language? It can't be a dying language for now. Um, if you, uh, because Houdini is actually saved as a, as a crap load of HScript commands. And the interface to Mantra is HScript. Um, there's the VM underbar HScript commands that instructs Mantra what to do. So unless we completely re-architect Houdini's uh, file format and re-architect Mantra, uh, HScript is going nowhere. Um, HScript is a, a very powerful language when it's working with Houdini, but it's not very programmatic in that you can't write uh, reusable functions. There's no sense of object-orientedness to it, and that's why there's HOM or the Houdini object module with, pipeline, with Python wrappers, right? So, yeah. Question about fuzzy logic, uh, if it's possible. Question about fuzzy logic, if it's possible to be used Anywhere? As Vex functions? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I have to get off my derriere and, and show some examples of using uh, fuzzy logic to do things other than uh, choice logic inside of crowds. Fuzzy logic is just, uh, just a Vex function, a couple of Vex functions which you can call and use for anything. You can use it to soften edges, to randomize choices in whatever we're doing, in whatever context we choose to use, so I actually have a nice, a few nice work use cases that I would like to get out there. We know, I know we have the new website. I would really like to get uh, a couple of these ideas out there. But yeah, it's 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 it can be used well outside of the crowd workflow. It's just a vex function that just takes some takes a variable that's varying, and then it uh, it can create some fuzziness around that variable. Okay, hey, Jeff, just a quick yep. time check. We're at uh, twelve forty-two. Yeah, got about ten minutes left in the presentation, and maybe gonna crunch. Questions. Going to crunch through the crowd stuff then. A uh, ton of workflows on crowds. I think the big overarching thing with crowds now is you can now use them to do hero-like crowds. So, um, so we have agents on floors, walls and ceilings, agent configured joint swap improvements. So, and the agent configured joint swap is amazing because now it has a button for every 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 bone that you want to bring in and it actually when you press the button it says compute uh, rotate angles it actually will look at all the motion files that are bound onto that agent in the in the in the agent shop of the agent object so mocap biped 3 hda brand new hda um, we have mocap biped 1 2 and now 3 and 3 as you can see from the snapshot uh, has a new tab for animation and material so we separated that out uh, separate the two. So now under animation, you can actually specify the type. And there's a, I think there's about a half dozen of the animation type. And then for each type, there's uh, more than 10 or 20 uh, various clips for each animation type. And that's all part of the agent. And that means all of that can be extracted and used and switched between in, in any animation. So we also add an extra frame for proper looping. And a new and uh, so let's take a look. Here's a bit of a, an example movie. Hopefully this plays for you guys. But in this case, we have uh, uh, the agents that fall are mocap biped two, and uh, because they don't have the various <laughs> new motion clips with the added for moped biped three. So moped biped three is smarter by the very fact that he's simply got more motion cycles to to index in to do much better avoidance. Although they can't avoid the, the sphere, so. And so it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a big step forward. And, and also, if you're creating your own agents, it makes for, for a great template 
to uh, to sort of wedge your own uh, character in motion inside of it. So accurate foot planting, um, that uh, more VEX. Uh, we've added another another couple of VEX functions as well as we now have a new um, chop workflow added to the the train of day the agent trained adoption asset, which allows you to create a chop network, which actually constructs the intermediate um, motion files given the motion files that are on the agent. So chops are now being used to synthesize motion, which then get used to augment the agents as they walk on the terrain to keep the feet sticky. So again, uh, going as far as we can uh, without having to rely on, um, on a full body IK solution. So, so we're trying to push it as far as we can. Um, oh, and one more thing as well as support for rigs without toes like spiders. So yeah, somebody's out there doing spiders. Um, so here's a couple examples. On the left is the 15.0 foot plant, and on the right is 15.5, not 0.05. That would have been me rushing. So you can see the feet are a lot better behaved on the terrain. So FBX agents, um, big step forward with FBX agents. We can now directly import them right into Houdini uh, without having to actually bring them into Houdini and cache them out. They can actually be loaded directly in the agent SOP. And uh, it makes it a much quicker to turn around things because a lot of these FBX agents have a lot of complexity to them. So the more you can do live off of disk, referencing off of disk directly and not having to cache things out, makes things a lot more procedural. So that's now added inside of 15.5. Some crowd solver improvements, uh, easy for forces to influence agents with locomotive clips, and things behave a lot better. Yes, you can get some pretty ridiculous forces on the agents now. Obviously, you can push them beyond the scope of what the, what the uh, motion clips can support, but still it hangs together pretty well when you apply uh, influence forces. Um, and there's minimum sliding and spinning of agents. I think the biggest thing for 15.5 is when you get two crowds milling and interacting with each other, the avoidance no longer looks like a bad games engine. <laughs> Actually, they look like they're really engaging characters with believable motion to do with both avoidance and to do uh, avoidance of characters and avoidance of objects. So train adaption SOP, uh, new train adaption SOP, but this one's a bit different. Um, it adds a new spin onto the crowd tools where we now no longer have to do the crowd tools through, uh, through DOPS. So we can perform train adaption after the simulation and we can use it for simple crowd shots with no simulation. Uh, we also have agent prep SOP improvements to also augment that, again, where uh, we can create a chop network to build the motion paths for the actual terrain adaption. So it inspects both the character's uh, sequence cycles as well as the terrain. And it tries to build the corrective shapes for those agents to follow the terrain. Vertex normal support, um, very important. Now that we're starting to load FBX rigs directly off of disk, we need to have vertex normal support because uh, everybody else uses vertex smoothing normals. Um, we're starting to get onto that as well. Uh, right now, 15.5 uh, vertex normals are fairly well supported, um, but having direct support inside of the crowd tools and updating these vertex smoothing normals is critical because a lot of times these agents are lower resolution, but they use these vertex smoothing normals to generate uh, higher detail just by simply cheating shading, right? So supporting that properly in deformation is very important, especially again loading them directly off of disk. Locomotion controls. Um, uh, so we have two requirements for a hero. Uh, we have a requirement from, from studios. Uh, for hero foreground crowds. And although DOPS does a pretty good job of locomotion, um, for those really highly directed agents that are very close to the camera, those hero agents inside of our crowds, you guys want to take over. And so that's why we've done a lot of work with the locomotion controls to allow and give you guys improved locomotive clip support. So you can provide your own locomotion to, to uh, to motivate the characters for the scene so you can really tightly direct them. And we can bake additional non-transform channels into the agents to support that. So you can actually insert your own locomotion channels and then reference them in and, uh, and motivate your characters that way. So it's more of an advanced control. Um, but you can see from the, from the list on the side how many options there are. So there's a, a retiming behavior, allowed speed variance, so lots of controls to do hero characters. And there's the new agent chop. 
So another big important step forward for me is it opens up this whole new world for CHOPS and CHOPS for me is a very familiar area. Um, if you don't know anything about channel operators, uh, they allow you to take in anything and represent it as channel data and then you can use uh, synthesized motion, audio, or use a whole vast number of tools in there to modify that, these, these channels. In this case, it's uh, loading in the motion, baking the motion out. Yeah, baking would be the correct term, or, or baking the motion out of an agent or many agents, and then you can do whatever you want to that channel data. So now that's possible, and you can actually inspect the agent itself. Stepping a little further, uh, basically looking now at texture improvements. Uh, we now have added big curvature. We were saying that Houdini 15.0 was missing curvature, now it has it in 15.5. But we've implemented as a new curvature bob, which means it's open to be used in any shaders. And it's great for adding wear to surfaces as a, as a mask, uh, control mask for dirt and rust. And because we added it to the lens shader, um, it means that any image plane can be baked out with curvature. And go ahead with your question. We have a question about if there's a way to see texture variations in viewport based on layer layers name layer names. Oh, based on the layer names. So the layer name would be the UDIM layer, or was it? Oh, the texture layer. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm gonna get a little bit more information because I don't know what he means by texture layer. It could be a few things, but uh, okay. So big curvature. So this is 15.0. Um, we didn't read really everything but uh, curvature, and this 15.5. And there's many different options to bake the curvature. You can see the animated GIF on the bottom, hopefully. Hopefully it's updating for you guys, it's updating for me. But you can see there's several different ways of generating the curvature. And again, curvature is one of those great masks that can be used for generating dirt and uh, grime, and you can change the up vector. There's a whole bunch of different options you can do to that. Another um, another VOP that we added is the UV triplanar VOP. And what it is, is it's basically a high-level digital asset that allows you to supply text, three texture maps or six texture maps. And it does planar projections in the X, Y, and the Z axis. And there's options to do positive X, negative X, positive Y, negative Y, and, and positive Z, negative Z. So you can actually apply texture maps to all the various different axes, and it has a really good algorithm to do the blending. And again, it's all built with ops, so if you dive inside of it, you can see how it's actually constructed. And at the heart of it, there's actually three UV planar project bombs, one for each axis inside of it. So if you wanted to, for instance, to use patterns with UV planar project or with the UV triplanar project, um, you can either crack the asset open and then dive inside and inspect it. Maybe Fiona will do a little two minute video on that in the future because she was having all kinds of fun with that when I showed her how to do that. Yeah. Or um, we also show you how to use the raw UV planar projects and how to wire that into more encompassing vault networks. The best thing about UV triplanar for me is no hard seams. Um, no stretch textures is the most important part of all. Yeah, Fiona says no stretch. Absolutely. That means we can use patterns. Any pattern inside of VEX and VOPS, and it won't be stretched. It will be nicely normalized. And the magic that's happening behind the scenes is this these planar projection VOPS know about the size of the object, and then they'll normalize across that. So it makes it for a really powerful workflow. And there's no UVs required to texture. Um, I've actually seen, um, I was blown away by this uh, several years ago when one of our top Houdini artists uh, textured an entire spaceship. And it was a huge spaceship for Halo. And I think it was the previous, uh, previous trailer. We need a horn for a name drop. If I start dropping names, we need a horn. <laughs> so we're not going to drop the fellows. Maybe I should later on, I should have asked them beforehand. But. More webinars. <laughs> yes, so the big spaceship, and it only had uh, a handful of texture maps, and everything was generated on the fly, and I was blown away. And as soon as I saw UV triplanar inside of Houdini, I just went to town with it. It was an amazing job. Again, thank you, R&D. Thank you, Scott. And this is uh, Flippy using the triplanar project with uh, some rock textures on him. And sometimes, okay, so we also have UV layout improvements. Uh, so um, UV layout, SOP, uh, tighter UV island packing, it's better. It's still not 100%, but it's better, and we're working on it. Um, 
And uh, but in 15.5, it's a really really nice update for 15.0. Plus, there's an an added orthographic orientation of UV panels. So if you've got a lot of orthographic panels, they'll now be oriented correctly. Yep. Go ahead. Question about triplanar <coughs> objects. Uh, oh. Triplanar project. Um, okay. Will it work nicely with animated objects or just still geometry? Um, it'll work perfectly fine with animated objects. As a matter of fact, it's really hard to get this thing not to do static projections. I mean, uh, trying to get a swimming texture with UV triplanar is, is really, really hard to do. I mean, I tried. And uh, yeah, you can do it. But it just envelops the geometry. But you can use REST. So there's the, the time-honored REST attribute inside of Houdini. I think it's used, I think it's known as solid texture in other applications, but uh, you can use UV REST. So VR camera, uh, I guess there's this thing, this craze out there for VR. Um, uh, we have a new VR camera, and it was wrapped on the VR lens shader. So basically, we have this new VR lens shader shop, which you can apply to any camera. Um, but we do have a nice wrapped up VR camera that supports uh, a lot long cube maps and perspective mode. And, and it also supports uh, uh, VR lens shader, shader camera pairs as well. So this is just a quick snapshot of it. And here's a quick video. Hopefully this is playing for you guys correctly. And uh, this one is another one using stereo pairs. And again, it's, it's really easy to generate these, these content. Although I, I'm quite a fan of putting the camera on an agent head and then watching the agent walk through the crowd. That's a lot of fun, too. Um, so camera overscan. We've got a whole bunch of little stuff coming up now, and then we'll see if we can leave a couple minutes for Q&A. But camera overscan, really simple. Add the property, uh, image overscan, uh, supported by mPlay. And more importantly, you can do it in EXR and support it in Nuke. So finally, you no longer have to do that monkey magic to get your res to over res your image and then use crop planes. It's just simple, just your overscan in X and Y. How many pixels do you want? And then it just does the correct thing. Uh, Houdini viewport now is full displacements, uh, improves BFDS and BRDFs to match mattress types. We also added Euler to 90s Euler tumbling method, which means you can now tumble over the pole. So if you're very used to that in your application, you can do that as well. And this is just a quick snapshot of what that looks like with some nice shading matching the BSDFs inside of uh, Mantra. And the OpenGL ROP, uh, big update in the OpenGL ROP. Uh, motion blur support, depth of field support, and it's got a new limits tab. And it's very much becoming very equivalent to the Mantra render operator as well. So um, it's, very full, it's quite full featured. And uh, just make sure your graphics card is, is ready to handle some of the options that you can have. It's got insane anti-aliasing options of 64 times oversampling and uh, very, very, very large resolution oversampling. So it's, uh, it's a great front end to your graphics card. If you have the uh, latest and greatest NVIDIA graphics card, it's a great node. Play Bar Dope Sheet. Um, I definitely want to do a whole thing on animation, but the Play Bar Dope Sheet in 15.0 allowed you to do multiple selections, but in 15.5, it allows you to do overlapping selections. And in the Play Bar, it's so easy, you just hold down the middle mouse button, and you press uh, Control C, Control V, and you can very quickly cut and paste all of your motion while simply holding down the middle mouse button really fast to quickly move replace the keys. The Dope Sheet Editor has the same uh, performance improvements that the Play Bar has. But again, you can select multiple regions, including overlaps now, and actually move them properly. And again, it has that same middle mouse button. Hold that middle mouse button, and you can drag and drop, cut and paste, what's ever under the cursor. Uh, parameter Spreadsheet um, also saw a lot of improvements. But believe it or not, the Parameter Spreadsheet is the only GUI tool that we have right now in 15.5 where you can copy the entire animation channels or the entire animation animated parameters from any node onto another node as long as the names match. So we can actually have two characters and then copy the motion over using the parameter spreadsheet. Fiona's laughing because <laughs> she's been waiting. It's a comment. Oh, it's a comment. Oh, we'll We're going to marathon through all of these at the end. This is yeah, yeah. a sweet voice. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, Help system. Um, I thank you, Matt. Helps looking really good. Um, very readable, uh, cleaner layout, more legible. Um, I really like it. And I think the big thing for large facilities is uh, you can have a central help server without an engine license. Yay. So now you can go site-wide on this without, without any restrictions. So that means more people can access the help, right? And it has an improved search. I really like the search inside of here. When you're searching for words, it gives you a really long uh, list of all of the targets on the right. Very well done. Uh, performance, uh, 
minor things here. Um, but I think the one thing that, uh, two things we need to take away from performance in 15.5 is Alembic is faster reading and writing, and VEX. Uh, VEX saw some really nice background improvements that uh, Mark Elent was able to backport into 15.5 without affecting too much. And that also means that uh, always scrutinize VEX operations. You never know there might be a problem, and please submit the bugs. We'll fix them as fast as we can. Uh, all of that, I haven't had any issues with VEX, by the way. I'm in 15.5, but it does affect all VEX code from Wranglers to Mantra shaders. Houdini Indy, finally, as I said before, support for render engines, Arnold, V-Ray, Octane, Redshift, and Rigaman 20. And if you have a really good candidate, uh, let us know. Uh, and more, finally, HQ performance improvements for HSOP UI improvements. Um, all the little stuff in there. There's a whole bunch of other things. Um, again, download that document that I attached to the webinar, and you guys can have a, a deep read through that and print it out. And, and uh, definitely, sh um, it's good framework for exploring the 15.5 moving forward. Oh, the last one, photon tracing controls for indirect environment maps. That's uh, a, a minor but important enhancement for when you're using uh, indirect lighting with environment lights and you have a lot of portals and uh, much better rendering in that, in that specific case. But it's doing some really interesting things behind the scenes that we might be able to exploit in the future. And that's it. So that concludes the rip through the slides, a little bit of Houdini interaction. Would have liked to get more into side of Houdini. Uh, had a lot of interesting questions though and I guess we got a couple minutes. I guess this concludes the presentation. If you guys want to hang around for another five, ten minutes, uh, we'll certainly answer a few of your questions. Um, let's see if we can okay. address some of them. I'm just going to oh, plow, okay. plow through them. Uh, any hope of Houdini Engine for plugin for Moto? I don't know. Okay. I haven't heard of anything. Actually, um, definitely put the request. I think two things for that request. Obviously, ping the foundry. See if there's a, see if there's a desire there, and also ping us, and uh, let's see what happens there. And uh, hopefully, there's a third party that's willing to step up and do the the port in uh, the short term. Yeah. Okay. Next is how about future interactivity with Fabric Engine? Um, we already have a pretty good interaction with Fabric right now inside of Houdini. Um, yeah, we're always interested in hearing more about that uh, that part of the pipeline. Uh, Fabric has proven itself to be a critical tool for a few studios, and we definitely want to make sure that uh, Fabric works well with inside of Houdini. Uh, next, is there any development plan for small-scale fluid sim improvement, more robust surface tension, and meshing methods that preserve folds and contacts? Um, we do have the next release. We are engineering a lot of um, um, no, no solver updates in this release. Um, we're Definitely investigating all of that right now. And who knows what's going to end up in the next release, but we are certainly actively and aggressively looking at all of those different features. So yes, good things are going to be coming soon. Um, there's a question about uh, local variables, e.g. $F, completely being replaced by attributes at time, for um, example. Yes, um, that's correct. Um, we are moving more towards wrangling and more towards a local attribute support in all the SOPs. And none of the new SOPs are using any of the local attributes, uh, such as the point SOP and the copy SOP and a few of the other ones. Um, if we do deprecate those operators, I can tell you that we're going to treat them with a lot of care as we, because they will need to be updated at some point in time to work within this new scheme. And the new scheme is working. We're seeing a lot of users now being able to make sense out of attributes and how they flow through the various operators. So we know we're on the right track there. And of course, if we're doing something wrong, please let us know. So there's also a question about, um, do you anticipate that at attribute expression format will become more prevalent? Um, yes. Yeah, I can see that becoming more prevalent, yes. OK. Yep. Um, there's a question about finding a summary of all new VEX functions. Do you know where you guys can find that? Oh. Um, I guess the best bet is what's new, but we can take that as a takeaway. Okay. Um, we really should have a list of all the all the new VEX functions. Um, that should be able to to figure that out pretty quickly. So please note that one. Okay. Um, and a follow up to the texture variations in the viewport based on layer names. Um, so I think it was Mar Marco. Um, he said that he's uh, he's able to see that with the material style sheets, but 
he has to render it, so. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, so that's the, I understand exactly what he's talking about right now. Yeah, so material, material style sheets is still a tool that's evolving rapidly within the lighting, lighting framework inside of Houdini. You're absolutely right, there is no viewport support now for seeing advanced material overrides, and that is, uh, that is a critical missing feature. Um, so definitely we are looking into improving that, that whole part of the lighting work with style sheets for the next major release. So yeah, please hold your breath there for a bit, but I understand uh, your frustration. So you always have to use the IPR and, and Mantra running. IPR is a bit faster at firing up in 15.5, does that help? So. Um, next, can Triplanar become a UV um, exported with a mesh? Um, absolutely, it can. Uh, the first stab at this was an all-sing and a dancing mob, and that's why I was saying um, you can crack it open and you can definitely export the UVs that are coming from the three UV project VOPs inside of there. Absolutely, it can, can export the UVs as well. Yeah. What's the best way to create ambient occlusion renders in Mantra? Ambient occlusion is old school, so um, you basically have to back off Mantra a lot. You basically want to turn off uh, a lot of the PBR stuff and then go into ray tracing mode. And then once you're in ray tracing mode, you can then use uh, the environment light. And there's three options on the environment light. I believe the second option, not entirely sure, but I believe the second option does an ambient occlusion pass for you. or um, inside of your surface shader that you're building, you can just add a loose VOP, the ambient occlusion VOP, and you can big out ambient occlusion there. It won't be as efficient, though, because it's still going to have the overhead of rendering a PBR render. Um, yeah, but that's, that's two ways that I know. Probably the former, just do a ray trace pass with ambient occlusion um, with an environment light. And remember, when you're doing ray tracing, it's the samples on the environment light that are key, because uh, the output driver in ray trace mode uh, behaves differently than with PBR, so you do have to oversample the lights when you're dealing with ray tracing. Opposite is true of PBR. If you're using PBR with environment lights, definitely turn the samples down to one or two, one, and then try to do oversampling inside of the ROP. So ray tracing, ambient occlusion in the environment light. Um, so there's a question about if you're planning any for hair master classes, in-depth do and don'ts, prefer workflows from start to finish, like caches, optimization, rendering. Um, master class in that area would be great. I'd love to see uh, the developers give us a master class on the latest and greatest in the inside and outs of 15.5. Yeah, and styling and the styling options you have inside there now. Okay, and um, how is overscan handled with Houdini ND? Good question. I believe the resolution hit on ND is hard. So if you want to do an overscan, on um, the HD res, yeah, I, I think, I haven't tried it, but I think you're going to be SOL. Sorry, out of luck. So, <laughs> he's smiling. <laughs> I so think you know that what? means but, but, something but, else. But you guys got us to do the, the multiple render engine support, so definitely your voices count here, right? And it's an active audience, so please let us know, and we'll, we'll definitely see what we can do there. I think overscan is an important thing if you're doing your own creative work because if you want to add some, some camera jitter or some motion or some motion trailing that you want to do in comp, you have to overscan in, in, a, in a full production environment. So why can't you overscan inside of Indie when it's intended to also be used on a limited production basis? You'd have a valid argument in, in submitting a request for enhancement or an RFE into support for that. Uh, so since Houdini is pushing for a more central role in the pipeline and branching into VR. Are there any plans to develop the surface model into a contemporary layer-based shader since Houdini is now complemented with the principal shader? Yeah, again, <laughs> that's a pretty interesting question. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, so let me... Let's... So, since... And branching into VR, are there any plans to develop the service? Oh, 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 yeah. Um, I can't talk about that right now. So <laughs> there's, um, I do say this, um, because um, version, the next major release of Houdini, it's going to definitely uh, see a huge change in, in shading with regards to that. So I would very, be very comfortable in saying that there's going to be some interesting uh, uh, interesting methods of mixing materials at multiple levels in, in the next release. 
so I can't say very much more than that. But uh, yeah, that's certainly innovative. Oh, by the way, Houdini 15.5, I noticed there's some questions into support, does not need a license. So Houdini 15.5 does not need a 15.5 license. It runs on 15.0 licenses. Feel free to download the software, install it, and run forward. Remember, it's just a branch off of 15. So the intention is that you guys can switch over production from 15.0 to 15.5, and it'll be seamless. Um, okay, so the last question, um, and sorry to everyone whose questions didn't get answered. Um, at the quick EQ, what exactly are changes to the 4-H SOP? Oh, 4-H SOP. Um, just a little bit more sanity around some of the parameters, so it's a little bit more... Uh, on, uh, there was a couple of things in it that weren't that straightforward to understand, so simplifying some of the, some of the options inside of the 4-H, what that was all about. It's just making it a little bit easier to use. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all the time we have. So now. it's, it's uh, one ten. Uh, so hopefully it was good for everybody. I, I, as I said, I'm in my element when I'm doing these things. Uh, uh, as I said, one of the things that I really want to do is uh, fire up Houdini, use it a bit more in anger, so you guys can have a really good taste as to how somebody would actually use the software. Um, I have. Uh, I have a very simple way of using Houdini, but very complicated, where I can rip through any scene. So um, very easy for me to take a look at ideas and sketch out ideas. And uh, I, I had a blast. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Fiona. It's... Maybe we can, when we post the video online after, um, people can suggest future webinars. Sure. We did a quick poll. Yeah. Oh, we did a poll. Yeah, and we got some results. So <clears throat> fantastic. Yeah. Well, I don't want to take up very much more of your time right now. As I said, this is being recorded, so it'll be available for watching later on. And uh, hopefully it'll spur some more discussions. And uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy Houdini 15.5 on behalf of Side Effects and all of R&D. Test it, hammer it, submit issues, uh, and do great work with it. And we, I have, we all have a great time seeing the amazing stuff you guys are using with the software. And uh, it's a hoot waking up every morning and watching the latest Vimeo video footage from, from you guys using Houdini. So keep it up. And thank you very much. We have everybody here. Bye. <laughs>